I'm a privilege to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mrs. Gloria Anson. She is the uh, president and diocesan director of the Sacred Heart Apostolate Incorporated in Syracuse, New York. For the past 41 years, she has conducted over 5,000 enthronements in homes and in public domains, such as the Franciscan University, a governor's mansion, and the Diocesan Eucharistic Conference in Atlanta. The Sacred Heart Apostolate reaches every state in the U.S. and all over the world, including such faraway places as Guam, the Philippines, West Indies, and Nigeria. Gloria has conducted catechetical workshops across the nation and was the chairwoman of multiple Sacred Heart conferences, including the Sacred Heart Family Conference in 2007 and the organizer of the 2011 First Sacred Heart World Congress in France. Sister Gloria Anson. Good morning. How are you this morning? You doing all right? Wow, is that a spotlight? (laughs) See, Mary, the spotlight's on you. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you all uh, for this invitation. And I want to greet all of you in the hearts of Jesus and Mary. I'm so happy to see some faces I haven't seen in a long time. And so happy to meet some of you new ones as well. So I just want to take a few moments of your time to speak a little bit about the condition of our hearts in the light of his. You know, as I've been traveling around, there's a real sense of urgency in the heart of Jesus that we get our hearts in order with his, that we live under the influence of his heart and of her heart. There's this sense of urgency. And I know, especially in these past five years, uh, more and more is this invitation that he's inviting us to having a heart-to-heart relationship with him is so important today. You know, we see all the stuff that's going on. We heard a little bit about it today, some of the speakers sharing. And uh, we see it everywhere we go. It doesn't matter what part of the world we're in. But all of us have wounds. All of us have difficulties within our homes. Sometimes, though, our problems become our God. And I think this is where our Lord is trying to tell us that he's the one that's going to take care of all those hidden wounds. And so as we travel around and and experiencing this apathy as well is a sense of urgency, a sense is that, as John Paul, St. John Paul II said, the imbalance that we see in society today is a reflection of the imbalance that's within the hearts of us. So the imbalance that we see and experience today comes from within. So there needs to be a right order of things. Now, I think also we need to recall to mind that God is with us. That's why I love the enthronement of the Sacred Heart, because that's the gift of it, that we become aware that God is with us in the ups and downs of family life. A good example of it is when I was at a Marian conference. Some of you may remember me telling you this story. It was at a Marian conference. It was like 2,000 people. Father that I work with had the Blessed Sacrament, and he was called to go through, going up these stairs and to go through with the Blessed Sacrament as Jesus was reaching out and touching and healing wounds. And so as I'm walking up the stairs to prepare the way, I'm saying to the people, watch out, move your pocketbook, move your feet, because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And suddenly, it wasn't just here that I was saying it, but it was from here, and I recognized it. Jesus is coming. I felt like Mrs. John the Baptist. You know, Jesus is coming. Suddenly, in that midst of all those people, they became aware that God was with them. I saw first a man reaching in his back pocket, pulling out his wallet, holding it up as the Blessed Sacrament was walking by. Jesus, Jesus, this is, this is a picture of my wife. She's in the nursing home. Jesus, please heal her. Let her know you're with her. 
Oh, Jesus, please give me the strength to be by her side each day. Please, Jesus. And it was like nobody else was there. He was just connected from his heart to the Lord's heart. And then some woman pulls out a picture, and she starts showing it. She says, Jesus, Jesus, this is my son. He's an alcoholic. Heal him. And suddenly, in this hall, there were so many others. But for me, suddenly, I'm standing there, and it was like an explosion. It was like an explosion of faith that wasn't there before. The whole atmosphere was just filled with faith. And that is what is so needed today. Golly, I can tell you how that is witnessed to me over and over again. Going into a place called Metairie, Louisiana. Perhaps you'll remember that place. We came right after Katrina was there first. And as we came in, there was this little boy. And the little boy was set calling. He says, come over, come over here. Now, I had no idea who he was. Come over here, he said. Come over here. My mommy is sick. So he's pulling us over, and he's pointing to his mom. He said, my mommy is sick. He said, she's sick again. So he says, pray for her. Now, this little guy doesn't even know us from a bag of beans, and he's saying, pray for my mommy. What's your name? Jared. How old are you? I'm nine years old, and my mommy's sick again. So I said, Jared, no one loves your mother the way you do. So you put your hands on your mother, and I'll talk to Jesus. At the end of the mission, this little guy brings his mom and dad and his two sisters up in front of everybody, again, before we even started the service. And he's yelling to everybody, this is my mommy. She was sick, but now the sickness went into remission. Everybody was clapping and applauding. And I thought to myself, here's a little guy. He has faith. He just believed. And I wonder, do we have that kind of belief? Oftentimes I'll tell the story of getting ready to go to confession. And as I'm getting ready to go to confession, and I remember have a list of things I want to say to get to the root of all these, why I keep doing this and that. You know what I mean, I think. So I would ask my husband, Jack, is there anything that maybe he wants to share with me? <laughs> And you know what, folks? He never runs out of material. Now, I'm not afraid to approach him because I am absolutely convinced of his love for me. I've been married to him for over 61 years. And I am so convinced of his love for me that I'm not afraid to approach him. I'm not afraid to ask him, is there something that I'm overlooking that helps my, makes my heart feel anxious or it's out of order? I'm not afraid because of his, I believe in his love. And same thing here, we're going to have sacrament reconciliation. I ask you the same thing. Are we so convinced of God's love for us that when we approach him, we know whatever is going to be said is going to be for the good? So I just wanted to share that with you. And I wanted to share with you also how kids get it. Uh, This kind of ties into what Father said. When I'm going out on a mission and I I get to talk to school kids, I particularly like the third and fourth and fifth grade because they get it. I have an image of the Sacred Heart. Carry that with me. And when we go into the schools, and I show it to the children because you know what? All these bad images are being put into his mind. How about putting some good, sacred image in the minds of these kids? And today, they're so influenced by all these other things, but they yet they can put it in their minds because they grew up with all these images. So why not an image of the sacred heart? So I'll hold up an image of the Sacred Heart and I'll say to each one of them, Wow, look at this! And I'll point out that Jesus' face and his hair and his shoulders and all of that. And I say to them, Look at that! What's this? That's his heart. Wow, what is that around his heart? And they'll say, Oh, that's the wounds or that's the, the lance or they'll tell. And I said, Look at that! Jesus is showing us his wounds. 
But you and I have wounds, but they're hidden, and they're only known to Jesus alone. So look at this image now. Now close your eyes and raise your hand when that image stays in your mind. Some of you that have had the enthronement of the Sacred Heart, you can do that yourself wherever you are. You can close your eyes and you can see that image in that sacred place in your home where you made a covenant of love with Jesus. So I say, look at this image, and they look at it. And I said, wow. I said, can you see his heart? Raise your hand. They raised their hand. I said, all right. I said, put your hand over your heart. And they do. They don't know this, but it's a contemplative prayer. And I said, now, put your hand over your heart. I said, now, whatever it is that's in your heart, tell Jesus right now as you have him present in your mind. Is it something wrong in your household? Is your father without a job? Are you nervous because your mom is crying all the time? Is your grandmother sick and it makes you sad? Is there somebody that said something to you? It doesn't hurt you in the elbow. Where is it hurting you? Yes, there in your heart. So these little children enter into this, and I just say this prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Shh. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Shh. Come, Holy Spirit. And just like now, there's that quiet God moment, and they're in touch. And some of them will cry. And afterwards, I said, keep your eyes closed. Now I want you to listen Put your ear against the heart of Jesus and listen to what his heart is saying to you. Again, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Again, dead silence. And then I say, all right, open your eyes. And you hear this, "Ah," sort of like what we say when we come out of confession. It's like a release. It's a relief. And some of them stand up in the stories that they tell me. These kids get it. One little boy in Tennessee was signing up at a table for the enthronement of the Sacred Heart. Mother said, what are you doing? I'm signing us up for the Sacred Heart enthronement. She says, now wait a minute. Your father and I haven't even discussed it. And the little boy said, What's to discuss? We need more love. These kids get it. And we do. And, it be, and so the, all the wounds that we have in the heart is because we're lacking in love. We're lacking oftentimes in unforgiveness. Like this woman in her late 70s, uh, ready for getting ready for an enthronement of the Sacred Heart. And I go and I ask her, is she inviting some of her relatives in? I only have one son, she said. And I said, oh, is he coming? Does he have children? Yes, he has one uh, son, so I have one grandson. I said, well, will they be coming? Do they live nearby? Oh, yes, but they won't be coming, she said. Now, the minute she opened up the door, I had a sense that she was sad and mad. You know, you've seen that. You can look at different ones here. And, you know, I can see some of you here that are sad and mad. It means you're carrying a whole lot of stuff in our hearts. That's why we got to give it all to Jesus. Amen? And so here is this woman. She's telling me, no, my son will not be coming to my enthronement. Well, may I ask why? Well, I haven't spoken to him in 28 years. You haven't spoken to your son in 28 years and he lives? What what is it? I wanted to know what it was and what could have been said to sever a relationship between a mother and a son. What is it? What was it? Sadly enough, you know what she said? Well, I don't remember. 
28 years. I don't remember. All I know, it was when the day that he got married, it was what that woman said. I said, well, what did she say? Well, I don't remember. Wow. No wonder she looks sad and mad. Unforgiveness is, is, is worse than cancer. It can kill our hearts. Dry us up. So the prayer team began to pray for this woman. So to fast forward, the grace of God, they connected her with her daughter-in-law and the son. I can't tell you. Uh, you just have to imagine in your mind what it was like when I knocked on the door to go for the enthronement itself. And this woman actually looked 10 years younger. Why? Because it was a reconciliation within the family. There was a recon- We And you know, this happens wherever we go. There might be some aunt or uncle or brother or sister or somebody in our family that we haven't even spoken to because over an estate or over something that somebody else said at a family picnic so you don't talk to one another and years go by and the heart gets harder. Even here, each one of us, sometimes somebody said something to us in ministry or somebody said to us as a neighbor. And so suddenly our hearts close right up, worse than a prison, just locks right up. And our hearts get harder and harder and harder. And we look older and older and sadder and madder. But today's a day when Jesus wants to come and to touch those hidden wounds. He wants to... Free us. Set us free. And what happens when he sets us free? I'll just end with two quick stories. It's amazing. His freedom and his mercy is available everywhere. Father Bill and I were a redemptress that I work with. We were in a place called Denver, Colorado, invited there by Archbishop Shapu to give a workshop on the enthronement of the Sacred Heart. They put us up in the Marriott. We come downstairs for breakfast, and here's this waitress. She looked like she should have come from New York, and I'll explain that in a minute. She comes with a coffee pot, right? And she's coming over to our table, and she says, Good morning. How you doing today, honey? Pouring the coffee. How you doing, honey? Pouring Father's coffee. And then she's saying, Are you Catholic? Uh, like, look at Father. He has a redemptrist, you know, habit on. And uh, so I looked, and I said, I stood up and I said, yes, I said, I'm, this is Father Bill, he's a redemptorist, a Roman Catholic priest, and my name is Glory Anson, and I said, and I'm a Roman Catholic, and I looked at her name tag and it said Monica. I said, are you Catholic? Me? With a coffee pot in her hand. Well, I was busy, I didn't have to convince it's been a long time, and so she told her story. She was mumbling it, aha. Uh-huh. Monica, oh my gosh, Monica. She said, what? Oh, I can't believe it. She said, what is it? I said, this is your moment. This is it. Oh my, she said, what? What is it? And I said, it's time for Father to hear your confession. And she said, uh, uh, and I said, here, you sit down in my seat. Oh, we're not allowed to sit. I'll bet your father can hear your sins standing up. I'll go over there, and I'll wait. Sure enough, I went over with my coffee, and I could see her talking to father and his head going like this, like this. And then that moment came, you all know of it. It's that moment when the priest raises his hands up like this to absolve us. We know that the minute he does that, heaven opens up. It parts. And here comes mercy. Mercy falling down all over Monica. Every single time the priest raises his hand to absolve us, just know that God's mercy is coming upon us. His mercy is available for us anywhere and everywhere. And sure enough, he absolved her. When I went to her, she was weeping and she was crying. And to fast forward the next day, she told us that she wasn't able to sleep. She said, I I just felt this peace I've never felt before. I was afraid to close my eyes. I was afraid I would fall asleep and wake up and that peace wouldn't be there. 
She says, a peace I haven't had. But you know what happened? She said, late at night, the telephone rang. I couldn't believe it. I heard this voice on the other end of the phone say, Monica, this is your father. Will you forgive me? Now, I don't know what that was all about. But she started to cry again. She said, I haven't heard from my father in years. I don't know what the situation was. Will you forgive me? He said. She said, at first my heart was so angry. Forgive him. And then she remembered that freedom, that peace, that mercy that came over her. And now she had an opportunity to pass it on. Mercy received Mercy given. Yes, Father, I forgive you. And again, right there in the restaurant, she began to weep and cry what God had done for her. And lastly, what God wants to do for us. I just have a few minutes to finish this story. This is a story about my daughter, Lori. Many of you may know this story. My daughter ran away very young age, got involved in drugs and alcohol and all of that. And so, through the grace of God, to fast forward, through the grace of God, uh, he brought her home. Well, we all celebrated. We rejoiced in what God had done. And then as a few weeks went by, doesn't she come up to me as I'm stirring the stew Hey, Mom, she said, is it all right if I invite Les to come over, she says, for dinner tonight? And I said, no, I don't think so. And she says, Mom, you know, the Lord has really touched him. He's different now. I said, oh, that's good, as I'm stirring the stew. She says, hey, Mom, aren't you supposed to be into this love stuff? And she says, you know, but can't you believe that God could do something to my friend Les? Look what he did to me. Look what he did to Dad. And so I said, Lori, I don't want to argue with you. I said, go downstairs and ask your father. Sound right, moms? A few minutes later, she comes running up. Mom, Dad says, whatever your mother wants is okay with me. I didn't want to hear that. You know why? I knew that my heart was out of order. I knew that something wasn't right. You know, you have that knowing place right here. And I knew that I knew. So I turned the stove off and I said, I'll be right back. So I got in the car and I went up to St. Joseph's. I walked down the aisle. It was supper time. Nobody was there. I walked down the aisle and I walked right up to the tabernacle. And I says, Jesus, oh, did I mention to you that this was a young man that sold her the drugs? And she wanted him to come to dinner. Jesus, I said, you know, I don't have this kind of forgiveness within me. You know all the problems. You and I have discussed this young man so many times. I just, she wants him to come. No, Lord, I can't. I don't, I can't forgive him. I just, I mean, I can say I forgive him, but not, it'd be from here, not from here. So I just want you to know that I know. And so then I left, and then a few minutes later, I read fifth and a pamphlet, He forgives, Jesus forgives. So I went back down the aisle, and I went before the tabernacle, and I said, All right, Jesus, I don't have this kind of forgiveness. Now, I never said a prayer like this before. I said, But I know and believe that you live in me. So then, Jesus, you forgive this young man out of my heart. I went home. I said, yes. The young man came. Now, mind you, when he came up those stairs, I don't understand it. Now I do, but then I didn't. Suddenly, with my eyes, I saw him, and I loved him. And my heart seemed to expand within me. What was this? And there was this power that moved me to run to him and embrace him. Today I know that I was looking at him from Jesus' eyes, and I was loving him with Jesus' heart within me, and I was embracing him in the power of God's love. So I embraced him, I kissed him on the cheek, 
And I, could, I was overwhelmed. I went into the bedroom. I shut the door. My daughter, Mom, are you all right? I said, no, I think I just had a sacred heart attack. She said, well, he's out there laying down on the floor. The power of God. So I got up and I said, oh, I said, I just, I welcome you. And you know what I learned from that session, that moment? I knew that we could say many rosaries. We can say lots of novenas, which we should. We can take lots of pilgrimages. But never, ever, ever are we more like God than when we forgive one another. Amen? Amen.